Okay, well, welcome back, class. Um, moving into preparation for our final exam um, right about now um, for Chem 152. So a couple review problems here to um, hopefully make sure you're prepared for that final and maybe uh, refresh a little bit of some of the things we talked about earlier in the semester. Um, so the first problem here um, on the review set um, looks like it's an intermolecular interactions problem that's going to relate to molecular structure. So let's let's look through this. We've got an isomer of uh, the formula C4H10O, um, and this particular compound was found to have a significantly faster rate of evaporation than a molecule with the formula C2H6O. Okay, so just in general, um, as molecules get larger, um, there's a tendency for them to have stronger intermolecular interactions based on an increase in surface area. So if you add more carbons, you might generally expect that the strength of intermolecular interactions would go up and therefore the molecules would evaporate more slowly. Um, so, and of course that is based somewhat on the structure because they could be different surface areas depending on how the molecules were connected together. Um, what we're seeing in this case is the opposite of that trend. We're seeing the larger molecule, which we would generally think has more surface area, um, actually has a faster rate of evaporation, meaning it's got weaker intermolecular interactions than the smaller molecule, the molecule with less surface area. Um, so what we should recognize here is that this must be an indication of different types of intermolecular interactions going on. Um, for a larger molecule to have a faster evaporation rate, or we could think about that as a lower boiling point as well, it must have weaker intermolecular interactions. So we want to draw a structure here for C2H6O that's got strong intermolecular interactions. Based on this formula, I would say that means hydrogen bonding. And then we want to draw a structure for C4H10O that doesn't have those strong intermolecular interactions, which leads to it evaporating more quickly. Um, so let's start with the C4H10O. Um, the stronger type of intermolecular interaction I just mentioned is hydrogen bonding. So I want to draw this structure so that there isn't any hydrogen bonding. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the oxygen to two carbons. Um, we should know that oxygen is only going to make two bonds. Um, if, it's, if otherwise, it would not have a zero formal charge. This is a neutral molecule. So it would be a good place to start to assume all the atoms are going to have zero formal charge. Now, from here, I can think about first, how am I going to attach the other carbons? So one option would be yeah, just add one to each side. Um, and let's draw a second option down here, um, which is also going to match our observations uh, described in the problem. And I'll put both carbons on, on one side. Right? And I'll get a different structure, right? So these would be isomers. They, they end up with the same molecular formula, but they have different structures. But in this case, neither would have hydrogen bonding. So both of these should have a weaker set of intermolecular interactions and evaporate fairly quickly. Now, we want to fill in the remaining 10 hydrogens. So we should, I mentioned we should know oxygen is going to make two bonds. We should know that carbons here, when they're neutrally charged, are going to make four bonds. That leads to a zero formal charge. So the best way to complete the molecule here is to just add all of the hydrogens um, around the carbons. That accounts for all 10 hydrogens. There would also then be two pairs of non-bonding electrons, or four total non-bonding electrons on the oxygen. Um, so this would be a polar molecule. This oxygen is uh, bent in terms of its molecular geometry or its shape, um, and that means this molecule is kind of negative by the oxygen, positive on the opposite side um, of the molecule away from the oxygen, um, because the oxygen being more electronegative is pulling electron density towards itself in the structure. Um, if we do the same thing down here in the second version of the molecule, the only thing really different is where we put the hydrogens. Right? Three of the carbons are kind of on the periphery of the structure, and they each need three more bonds to get to the four bonds we would expect for carbon. Uh, but this carbon is kind of in the interior of the structure, already has three bonds in the skeleton we drew, so it only needs one more bond, so that's where that one hydrogen would go, maybe depending on how you're counting, the tenth hydrogen would go there. Uh, we should still also have lone pairs 
on the oxygen or four non-bonding electrons on the oxygen. Okay, so both of those would work um, with our molecule. What wouldn't match the observations up here is if we drew C4H10O with hydrogen bonding, because that should imply a stronger intermolecular interaction, and that would be um, different from what was observed. Now, the C2H6O is the one that, that was said to have the slower evaporation rate, the stronger intermolecular interactions. So when we draw C2H6O, we do want hydrogen bonding. So I'm going to put the oxygen on the end of the chain of the carbons in the oxygen, so I can put one hydrogen there. Um, I can put the remaining hydrogens around the other two carbon atoms in the structure, and then two lone pairs on the oxygen. So that structure would match the observation up here. Um, I'd expect stronger intermolecular interactions here because of the ability to form hydrogen bonding interactions there on the edge of that molecule. And I'd expect weaker interactions here in these compounds because they are polar. They'll be dipole-dipole interactions, but not hydrogen bonding interactions. Now, there's several other isomers you can draw for C4H10. C2H6, the only other isomer you can draw, would have the oxygen in the center between the two carbons, right? And that doesn't match what we're seeing here. That's a fairly small molecule. Um, but it has no hydrogen bonding, and it is polar, right? So this just doesn't match. Um, so that would not match what we are describing here in this particular problem, but that's a structure you probably should be able to draw if you were asked to for that particular molecular formula. Okay, let's see if we can fit the second problem in here. Um, so problem number two here, we've got a sample of an unknown compound, dissolved it in some benzene, so that's our solvent there. Um, and then we're given the freezing point of pure benzene at 5.5, and we're told the mixture is found to freeze at a lower temperature. So this is freezing point depression, um, one of the colligative properties we talked about. So how much the freezing point went down is going to relate to how many particles are dissolved in the solution that we saw right there. Um, so you may remember the change in temperature of the freezing point is equal to the constant for freezing point depression times the molality of the solution. So freezing point depression and boiling point elevation use molality. Um, we've already got the constant here. We can solve for how much the temperature changed just by subtracting. So if we take that initial temperature, subtract out the lowered temperature and we get 0 0.35 degrees C. That is our temperature change. Now one thing to watch out for, in this case it's positive, the constant is positive, so we want to think of the temperature change as positive. I prefer to think of freezing point depression as negative because um, the temperature went down um, and that, that would mean the constant is negative. So you may see some problems when you're practicing where you see the negatives in there, particularly if you start using online sources where you're getting problems from different um, books or different sources. Um, but in this case, everything is positive. Um, but either way, if you, there are negatives, just don't claim that the molality of the solution is negative. You can't have a negative um, concentration of your solution. Okay, plug in 0.35 degrees C here for our temperature change. Plug in 5.12 degrees C per molal for our constant, and that gives us the ability to solve for the molality of this solution that we generated up here um, at the start of the problem. So if I divide both sides by 5.12, I will get the molality of the solution, and that is 0 0.06836. And you should know molality units are moles per kilogram. It's particularly important for this problem because to get to the molar mass, which is what we're asked in the problem, we need to figure out how many moles were in our sample. And the way we can do that is by taking the molality of the solution we got through the colligative properties and multiplying by how many kilograms of solvent were used to cancel out the kilograms on the bottom of our units. So 2.135 grams of benzene would be 0 0.002135 kilograms of benzene. Kilograms is going to cancel out there, and this will tell us how many moles of the unknown were in our sample. So I multiply that out uh, off screen here. Um, I get 1.459, keeping a couple extra sig figs here. Um, times 10 to the minus fourth 
moles. Now that we're almost done here, we know now know how many moles were in our unknown. Since we weighed out the sample to make this sample to compare the boiling points, we know how many grams are in our unknown. Molar mass, of course, is grams per mole. So if I take 0.0182 grams of the compound, divide by 1.459 times 10 to the minus fourth moles. That gives me the correct units to describe molar mass, grams per mole, and that comes out to be 0 0.0182 divided by 1.459 times 10 to the minus fourth. Comes out, so 124.74 grams per mole. Now, if we look at the problem though, um, we probably are limited to two sig figs here from our temperature change originally. So we should probably just round this to 120 grams per mole based on the data that we have for this problem. Okay, that's it for problem number two. We'll stop the video there and I'll post a different one picking up with problem three.